Psalm 101. I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord. I will sing praise. I'll be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. Whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. The one whose way of life is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning, I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. Thank you, Steve. Um, good evening, everyone. Let me add my welcome to, to Nigel's. My name's David. Um, I'm on the staff team here, if you don't know me. Um, and why don't we um, spend a moment in prayer before um, we come to this psalm? So let's pray together. Oh, Father God, thank you that your word is true, that it is good for our hearts to hear. It's good for our um, minds to take in. And please would you use these words um, that you would change us by your spirit this evening, that we would appreciate more of who you are and more of the wonder um, of our Lord Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Mission statements or vision statements. Do you, know what, do you know the thing I mean? The companies have these sort of lovely, grand, yet sort of confusing things that are like, this is, this is what we're about. I was reading on a website I checked that, that there's sort of three things that they're supposed to be. Aspirational and ambitious buzzwords if ever I've heard them, practical and achievable, achievable, um, and, and general, which doesn't really mean anything. But as, um, as I was thinking about this, it'd be great to just look at some mission statements um, that, that of some of the companies that we might know and love. So David, let's, let's get the slide. Oh, this is, this is a wonderful one. So to enable people and businesses throughout the world to realize their full potential. Who could that be? Anyone? Go on, shout it out. Microsoft. It, is it? It is! <laughs> James, I think you've been spending a lot of time on Microsoft, clearly. Uh, next one, David. Oh, to inspire and nurture the human spirit. One person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. What could that be? Starbucks, yes. Oh, you're very good at these, I thought. <laughs> to enrich people's lives with programs and services that inform, educate, and entertain. BBC, oh, free for free. Come on, last one then. To inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. Lego, absolutely, <laughs> Lego. Well, tonight, in, in this psalm that we're looking at, a, a really helpful way to think about it is David's mission statement. This is his vision statement for what it is to be a king. So it's not just... David saying these are his desires um, uh, for his kingship, but also what he wants, what he plans throughout the psalm. You see that there's lots of times he says, will do. And it really shows what his highest values um, are for himself and others that are to come and rule. The blueprint with which to judge him against, the ideal future picture of his rule. But so what, what, what was a, an Israelite king supposed to be about? Well, let's look at, um, listen to these words of David as he's speaking to his son Solomon um, about what it means. This is 1 Kings 2, um, 2 to 4, if you want to make a note. I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. 
Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. If your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. And so it seems like faithfulness to God and his law and leading the rest of Israel in this seems to be the major things here. But also justice between the people to judge what is good and to, ju- and to punish what is wrong, as we read about in 2 Peter, in 1, in 1 Peter 2 even. And you might think of it as these priorities of the king that that David wants to see, that he is saying these for himself, but also for Solomon and all the other kings that were to come after him. So let's get into exactly what those are. The ideals of the king, and the first is to have a heart for the Lord. To have a heart for the Lord. And this psalm begins um, with David saying he will sing praises to the Lord. Um, Because it's psalms, you probably go, yeah, Heard that before, heard that, just David sings, shocking, shocking, he's never done that before. But David starts off this psalm that is focused around what is to be an ideal king and what they're to do, what they're to be like, and he starts with praise. And pray, it's a clear response to God himself, to the Lord, a personal response that means that he would praise his holy name, a reflection of what is going on in David's heart, being outwardly expressed in this way. I don't know if you think of someone that's just been absolutely on top of the world. They're full of joy. They just can't, you know, they're sort of like dancing all over the place or just singing to themselves, humming, because they just can't help it. They're so full of joy that it just overflows. And here David is that person. And that is why he is singing the Lord's praise. He is responding in this way because he desires so greatly to praise God. And it's two particular things that he wants to praise God for. Verse 1 again. I will sing of your love and justice. Love and justice. Both things that are really central and crucial to God's character, but also that are true things of God's will. If you look back just to Psalm 100 that Tom was talking to us about last week, it talks about that idea of love. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. It's this idea of a covenantal love, a faithful love that has lasted throughout the ages and that he that God has for his people. Whereas justice is a slightly harder concept for us to grasp. But the way that I, I maybe helpfully, I hope helpfully, um, thought about it was to see it as um, encouraging the right and punishing the wrong in a way that is fair and consistent. As I said, justice is to be a prime concern of ruler, a duty that they are to fulfill. But in both these concepts, in in love and justice, we also see the nature of God. We see the vital importance of vertical relationship between God and man. But we also see the relationship of one person to another. So me and James, how we relate to each other is to do with justice and also can be to do with love, in all fairness. But particularly here, this love idea is about God and man. And so these show that centrality of faithfulness, of praising and of focusing on the Lord. As we saw a bit last week as well, Singing praises as a response to God is, is good and right. It's, it's responding to who God is and all that he's done. And even in verse 2, did you notice it? 
David cannot help but burst out with this line of longing. When will you come to me? Is that same outpouring of desire for the Lord. And this is to be the starting point for all of Israel's kings, for all kings and leaders. But it's a starting point for absolutely everyone. Singing and praising the Lord is a command for us to take seriously because it demonstrates the whole posture, the whole orientation of our hearts. It's crucial for ruling in line with God's will, but also striving to live for him now in this present evil age. Setting your mind, your heart, your hand, your whole being towards the Lord. The first ideal, to have a heart for the Lord. Second, and we'll spend a bit more time in this one, to live a godly life in private. In our society, it can feel like the idea of a, of a private life is sort of a myth, right? Whether that's because we feel like there's someone always listening and around, whether that be Alexa or Siri, whether that is just someone the other side of the wall with housemates, the flat next door, the landlord visiting, there's technology around us everywhere. There's people around us everywhere. But also there can be a very intentional side to this. We show our lives to others all the time. And often we, we want to do that, don't we? We want to share what we're about with other people. We want to share what we're doing. And also we... We are interested in each other. It would be strange if no one was interested in anyone else and we all lived on our own little box. Um, just, no, I, I, why would I want to hear what Silas is up to? You know, but hopefully you do. Um, but we're so fascinated. What's going on? You know, what are they doing now? Where have they gone on holiday? What diet are they trying? Where did they get those shoes? And social media is exactly a way that this happened. We see something that we cannot otherwise see. But you can also, might have heard someone say something like this, especially among politicians, it must be said. Their private life is their own business. You ever heard that before? And that's, that's a sentiment that many people share. The idea that, you know, as soon as I close the door, as soon as I um, go inside my room, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't have an effect on who I am in public. And we should just be happy to see people as they show us. We want to say that what is on our phone or our television screens on our internet history, on our bank accounts. That's, that's not for other people. Well, for David, his mission absolutely involves his private life. Look at verses two to four with me. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. David is very strong on this. A blameless life, a blameless heart and household. This feels like nothing but the highest of bars that he is setting himself up to lead. This is the life that he is aiming for. If, if I was to ask Nigel, so don't, don't answer, you don't need to. Like, are you conducting your life blamelessly at home? That's not a small thing to ask, is it? The idea of, of blameless being this sense of pureness, of holiness. 
uncorrupted. And verses three and four pull this out a bit more. David is saying that that he won't even look with approval on anything vile or repulsive or rubbish. He does not want to know these things. He doesn't approve of them. He does not want his eyes to take in their vileness. But it's not just the eyes that he, he thinks on. He also talks about the actions of faithless people. That David will hate and despise the very actions of the ones that are unfaithful or faithless um, to the Lord. Because they are not following God's ways or God's law. Not only does he, he hate them and want them out of his sight, but he will have no part in them. He will not share in those actions at all, putting them far away from him, creating that distance. Not the smallest action does he want that is not faithful to the Lord. But he wants to be blameless. And he goes even further, that those who are perverse, who have chosen to twist the way, move away from what is good and right and distort the two, they shall be far from me. I will not allow these things to twist me. And in summary, I will have nothing to do with what is evil. The stain of evil, of perverseness, of unfaithfulness will not be seen in in David's life. But he seeks to be pure, spotless and white, clean and, and unaffected by the dirt of sin. For David, the life that he lives in private and that he is aiming to keep blameless is absolutely the most important thing. He seeks to be upright, to live with integrity, consistency with the God that he has said that he serves and praises, the God that he knows and enjoys. What a picture that is of David's life and home. It is only seeking to follow God's ways, starting from praising him. Many would say that obviously that private life of a leader doesn't matter. Oh, they they might have told lies at, at home. But, but it's okay, they still lead that team so well at work. Oh, she, she, yeah, she does get quite angry at her friends. But it's not, it's not too often. Oh, he, he might have had an affair, but, but don't worry, he can still be trusted to run the company accounts. She's, yeah, she's addicted to gambling, but, but, but it, I, she speaks so well. He gossips about people privately. But oh no, but he but he always defends them in public. A life that might appear good publicly is not what David wants. And it's not what we should want either. A leader that lives a blameless life and seeks to follow the Lord's way that can be trusted, that can be followed, they can be that ideal king, that ideal ruler and leader. And it's it's easy to see the picture where this has played out many times. The failure of leaders due to their own personal sin, whether that's politicians, whether that's companies, and and most sadly, in the church. And now, of course, we we need to acknowledge that perfect perfection in our in our holiness this side of the of um, of eternity is um, is not possible. 
that we are working towards that, that perfect holiness, that we are working towards a blameless life. But if you are, if you are in that leadership position, whether that's leading a team in a company, whether that's in the Christian union, whether that's in a small group, whether that's in your family, is your heart set on such a lofty goal of blamelessness? Do you have a heart that longs for the Lord, that praises him for his character, his wonder, and his works? Do we feel the struggle and cry out with David, when will you come to me? Such is our struggle with godliness in this world, and it is a difficult one. Do we think that our lives must be blameless for the sake of the gospel, the sake of of our ministry, if that's what we're up to, for the sake of our family to flourish in faithfulness, that integrity isn't just a nice add-on, but is essential? David absolutely did. And will we? Proverbs 4.23 says this, and I think it's absolutely right for this moment. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. But maybe you don't particularly have um, leadership responsibilities, or you don't have that, that situation in your life. Maybe three things just to particularly think of for you. First, follow godly leaders who are godly, not impressive. There is so much that we can get wrong if we care about the outside appearance, how someone speaks, how someone looks or dresses, how how nicely they pray or they act in front of people. If we care only about that and say, that's a good leader, What we see in public is the only thing that matters. We are missing what's crucial. We are missing godliness. Follow leaders who are godly, not impressive. Second, know your leader's life. Um, If we say that the way someone lives, the godly life that leaders are to live is important, we probably should see it, right? how they are away from the workplace, how they are at home with friends and family. We need to see that their life up close and personal. Hebrews 13, um, 7 says this, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Consider the outcome. We need to see what their life and faith look like Otherwise, how can we consider its outcome? Knowing and and spending time investing in each other is the way that we can absolutely see and rejoice and encourage and struggle alongside brothers and sisters who are longing to be godly. And thirdly, and, and probably most importantly, I want to say, pray for your leader's godliness. Godliness is not an accident. It is an absolutely amazing work of the Spirit. Not just in bringing people to faith, but in refining us. In strengthening and helping to make decisions that serve others, not self. In choosing each day to pick up our cross and follow Jesus, not just in the easy bits, but in the struggle and the hardship. Now, godliness is not an accident. And so praying for our leaders, praying for their godliness is vital for them and for us. Thirdly, the third idea to encourage faithfulness in public In verse 5, it seems like David shifts a bit. And it seems like he's addressing um, particular issues within his court, in his advisors, his government, I guess. Um, 
And these are the ones that are helping him to, to run things in Israel, helping him to, advising him what to do. And he has some, some strong things to say here as well. David does not want to allow his court um, any slanderous. He doesn't want anyone that is proud or arrogant. But instead, he will silence their slander. He won't tolerate their attitude. In verse 7, he says, the same of those who lie, that they won't remain in his service or dwell in his house. They won't be in his presence at all. I was trying to think of a comparison, and this is the best I've got. Imagine a cabinet meeting in number 10. They're all sitting around the massive table, which just seems impractical, but anyway. Keir Starmer stands up, and he just says... All the liars, all the slanderers, all those that are arrogant and proud, get out. It'd be quite a statement of intent. But that is something of akin to what David is trying to say here. Is it saying that everyone needs to be perfect? All those that are his advisors, his courtiers, they need to be perfect? No. But it is to say that their attitudes, their hearts, and their faithfulness are not um, minor things. Because all of these, these sinful behaviors, they really reflect how we think of other people. Mostly, just how they are better than others. To think that a person is better. What pride that you would laugh, that you would slander, that you would lie. But verse 6 says this, My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. The one whose way of life is blameless will minister to me. The faithful will dwell with me. Those who, who do go after the Lord, whose desires are for God. The ones walking blamelessly are the ones that will assist, that will minister, like Joshua assisted Moses um, back in the Old Testament in Exodus. And David wants a court that is faithful. And through this, David is, is seeking to encourage public faithfulness, particularly in his court, not that pride, but, li but life that exists coming from that praise of God and himself seeking to live a blameless life. He wants others to share in exactly that. And one of the ways this might be particularly important for us as we, as we think about how to do this is who do we go to for advice. Who are the friends? Who are the people that we ask the difficult questions, the big questions? And if, if you feel like you aren't sure who that is, and it is worth pondering for a bit, because the Christian life is not easy. It is a hard and narrow way. Finding others that we can walk faithfully alongside is not just wise, it is vital, so that we can walk along and be ministered to by others. And if none of those friends are Christians, is that helping us live in a way that is faithful? But for those people, do they give godly and faithful advice? Do they care what the word of God does and help us apply it to our lives? Do we see their faithfulness, their godliness in display in each conversation and across all the advice that they've given us? And are we friends like that? Do we seek the faithfulness of others? Or do we just have conversations that feel skin deep? We're happy to talk about the trivial things. 
How was the match? How was the week? Rather than, how was your quiet time? How are you struggling with anger? To encourage faithfulness in public. And fourth point, to dispense godly justice. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to live in a corrupt state? Maybe not. No, not come up. Okay. Um, it's a strange, it's something that I think here we probably find quite difficult to imagine. You don't, you're not quite sure you can trust anyone that they're actually thinking of serving the public good. The government can't keep peace and order. The police seem to want to be bribed. If a government is failing to function because it's corrupt and its citizens don't trust it, it's an absolute breakdown in that society. And it's, it's worth something that we can be, be thankful for and praise God that we, we do live in a place where we do enjoy um, law and order, where there is justice carried out. But without that, it's a scary place to be. A place where laws are not cared about, where protecting people isn't, isn't necessary, where, well, will justice be done? So does it matter if I do right or wrong? A place where there is punishment for crimes and encouragement to do what is right. Justice is an essential thing in society. And we see this in, from leaders in, in the Bible. We see exactly that um, in Moses' day. In Exodus 18, we, uh, 13, we read this. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. Moses is being a judge. He's judging between complaints and, and issues between the people um, since he's brought them out of Egypt. And he's doing that morning till evening. Talk about a full-time job. That is all day. And it leads to the appointments of other judges um, f- that are elders and leaders um, throughout the rest of Exodus 18. But Moses, Moses judging in these cases, was important. It needed to be done. People have grievances that need to be resolved between others. And again, in in 2 Samuel 15, we read of Absalom, David's son, who undermines justice in the kingdom. He he does this. He says this to to Israelites coming along the road um, to the city for justice and dissuades them, saying, look, Your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or a case could come to me and I would see that they receive justice. And it seems plausible to them. It it leads to them doubting David's kingship at the time. And indeed, it says, to stealing the hearts of the people of Israel. Justice is a massive deal. So what does David say of it here? Verse 8. Every morning, I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. Just like Moses, he will sit in judgment, delivering justice every morning. It's happening all the time. Every morning, he's regularly administering justice. He is judging between what is right and wrong, between the good and the wicked, and is showing judgment upon that. He is, in other words, fulfilling exactly the duties that we see in 1 Peter 2, 14. Uh, to to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. But this idea of justice can feel very far out from where we are. I 
I don't know if anyone is a judge in the room. I'd be slightly surprised. Maybe lawyers, I don't know. But really, that idea of promoting what is right and punishing what is wrong feels a bit further away. But here's one way that it might play out. Do you value fairness? I'll tell you some people who do. Liam knows them well. Um, children. You gave them three sweets and I only got two. Oh, that's not fair. That's my child voice. <laughs> or or if, um, if one child uh, decides to jump off a sofa and you say, don't do that, uh, and then they did it again and I did nothing, would that be fair? And then another child comes along and I punish them straight away. There's, a, there's something that we just feel in that. We feel the unfairness of one being prioritized, one being favored, I guess, and someone being punished unjustly. Do we feel like, do we think about how we treat others fairly? Are we unfair in our dealings? Do we try to get one over on people? Do we speak harshly if we feel like they should know better? Do we favor the, the comments or opinions of certain people and ignore others? Do we speak against the gossip of one person, but not against our friend doing exactly the same thing? And so there, there is so much in these verses um, for those that are leaders. If you are a leader in any context, it's really worth spending time reflecting on this. Are the mission statements of your leadership, of our leadership, aligned to David's here? But obviously, kings and leaders are not just in the ether. They're, they are representing people as they always have. And they're supposed to be leading people into that same covenant faithfulness. They are seeking to encourage others to live in the way that David is encouraging. But also, if you're, if you're not a leader, is this a picture of an ideal king that you want? A leader that you would like or like to be like? This was very much David's desire. He will do it, as we said, throughout the psalm. But ultimately, David's legacy was one of failure. He committed adultery. He killed that woman's husband. He was not an ideal king. But he was still a man after God's own heart. And God, you, in his mercy, used these words, these, these plans, these hopes, these um, desires for a king, that others might sing it, others might reflect on it, but also look forward with great hope and expectation to the ideal and perfect king that we see in Jesus. Jesus is that perfect king. He does not just aim for these ideals. He fulfills them. He does just not just have a heart for the Lord, but is in joyous union with the Father and the Holy Spirit and is God himself. He does just not, doesn't just aim for a blameless life. He lived it perfectly. He died blameless in the place of sin-stained people like you and me a perfect, unblemished sacrifice. He didn't surround himself with people who thought they were perfect, but told the Pharisees, it's the inside of the cup that must be clean, so that the outside may be. He cared for the honor of God's house and commended the faith of not just Jewish people, but those outsiders, those foreigners, Samaritans, Romans, 
and he'll come again to judge the living and the dead. Tom talked last week about how this, this era of the Psalms that we're in is looking forward with hope while in exile. And it's not hard to think about how in exile they were ruled by those who were far from God. They were being oppressed. They would have longed for a king like this, one of David's line, one of David's heart, with this same mission. And for us that that know Jesus, we still wait in a place that is not our home in an exile awaiting an eternal rest, whether that be for a short or long time for some of us. We may be blessed by leaders seeking to follow exactly this way or who that deny the Lord. But we can look forward to the return of that ideal and perfect King Jesus and his eternal reign the king that has already won, but will finally return, will finally end all evil and tears and sadness and pain. And we have the great privilege to pray with absolute certainty for that day, for that end of exile, of our living under the ideal reign of King Jesus. Let's just spend a moment in quiet. Father God, thank you that we have this picture of a king, a king after David's heart, a king after your heart. Father, thank you that we can um, rejoice um, with the way that Jesus is exactly that king, that he fulfills all these things And he fulfills the many promises that you have given us. Father, please help us all to look forward to your kingship forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.